Well, I'd like you to look at a text here that in 1 Samuel in chapter uh, 30. And it's one of those stories, uh, once again, that Mama never told you. Mama, would you tell me the story about the annihilation of the Amalekites? Did you ever hear that one? Well, this is an interesting story. And to begin with, let me read to you from Shakespeare's Henry V, uh, because uh, this has to do, what he wrote about Henry V has to do with what we're going to read about with David here. And Henry V, uh, Henry V is about to step into the reins of the king, his father having died. And he hasn't been that good a prince. He was kind of a wild child. And so the Bishop of Eli and the Archbishop of Canterbury are talking about this new sovereign about to step to the throne. And Eli says, or rather Canterbury says, that there's nothing to worry about here. He says, the king is full of grace and fair regard and a true lover of the holy church. Eli says, the courses of his youth promised it not meaning he was one sorry teenager. And Canterbury responds, the breath no sooner left his father's body, but that his wildness mortified in him seemed to die too, yea, at that very moment. Consideration like an angel came and whipped the offending Adam out of him. That's what you need to say when you beat your child. <laughs> I'm going to whip the offending Adam out of you, child leaving his body as a paradise to envelop and contain celestial spirits. Never was such a sudden scholar made. Never came reformation in a flood with such a heady currents scouring faults, nor never hydra-seeded willfulness so soon did lose his seat. And all at once, at once, as in this king. They just marveled that he was so far away from being a king how amazing it is that it's like God's grace rests upon him now. That's 1 Samuel 30. David is about to, now David is, at this time is about 30 years of age. He started this process when he was about 16. He's gone through half his life almost being prepared for this moment. In chapter 31, Saul is about to die. David is about to ascend to the throne. And you're going to see here in chapter 30, like Henry V, you're going to see celestial spirits within and the offending Adam whipped out of him. He's not going to look like that runt of the litter that was protecting sheep and doing meals on wheels to the army. No, something has changed in him. This boy has gone from a teen to a young man to a king, and what God began in him, he has perfected until the day, as he does with us. Watch this. The context is, in the last couple of weeks, David has been among the Philistines at a city called Ziklag, and he's been there for 16 months. And in that time, he had to hide his lamp under a bushel. He lied about going out against the uh, Canaanites and Malachites of the land said he was going against Israel. He lived a lie. He tried to have the best of both worlds, faithfulness to God and um, uh, an easy acquiescence to the Philistines. You can't do that. And it got him in trouble. He had to now go out and fight against his own people. He was heading that way until God intervened and the leaders of the Philistine army said, what are these Hebrews doing among us? This guy is going to resort to what he is, a Jewish hero, and we're going to get killed. And so God wonderfully intervened, and David and his men went home, the 600. But he returned to Ziklag, to a city that was burned to the ground, their wives and children taken captive, and all of a sudden these men that were so loyal now mutinied, and they talked about stoning him. And then you saw David in faith go to God and strengthen himself. And he called, as he should have 16 months earlier, for the priest to bring the ephod with the Urim and the Thummim to give him divine guidance. And now he did. 
And God said, not only are you going to bring them all back, but there's not going to be one hair on their head perish. I promise you. And so David, with a mustard seed of faith, with the Adam whipped out of him, now seeks to rise and to lead his people like a king. Well, the question must come to David, how am I going to find these Amalekites? These are sons of the desert. It would be like uh, uh, pursuing, uh, let's say, Apaches uh, in old New Mexico there in the, uh, in the mountains. These are natives. They, they cover their tracks. How am I going to find them? What am I going to take for provision? We've just rode out three months. Three, days, ridden back three days, the city is burned, we're on limited rations. How do we do this? Uh, David heads off in faith, trusting God's direction of him into a wilderness with a past that has been wonderfully forgiven, but now he has to live with the ramifications of it in the future. Have you ever been there where you have headed off in life with the smoking ruin of the mess you made behind you. And you are saying, God, you'd better be there. You said I'll find them. You said they won't be killed. And you said I'll lead them back. We're hungry. We're tired. We hadn't had any sleep. My men are grieving. I just stayed, stood off a mutiny. I don't have anything in my corner but you. Now, I'm going to trust you. Have you been here? Well, you will be here. All of us have. Providence is going to step in in verse 11 and following. Providence is going to take care of him from the lowliest place you could do it. God is going to leave in their wake an Egyptian that was a slave to the Amalekites that has been left dead for three days without food or water, who is sick, unneeded because of the Jewish captives that were nice and healthy, and they got rid of him like an old light bulb, and they threw him out. So the worst thing that you could be is an Amalekite slave that is formerly an Egyptian, three days without bread or water, and you are dying, you're sick, you're cast off, and you're left for dead. That man is going to give victory to Israel. Watch this. In 11a, they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David. As it says down in uh, verse 13, I am a young man of Egypt, a servant of an Amalekite. My master left me behind when I fell sick three days ago. He is as good as dead, he is sick, and he is an Egyptian, a former enemy. God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. And the weak things of the world God hath chosen to shame the strong the base things of the world, to shame the noble, the things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are. And so God is going to strike a straight lick with a crooked stick. He just happens to happen onto this boy. Uh, faithful guys get lucky. Let me explain that. It's not luck. But God guides their paths. And so God has put a fellow in his path that's going to tell him where the enemy is, how long they've been there, and what they're doing. And he says, I'll take you to them. God has given him a compass. He just lucked out, quote unquote. God was sovereign over whatever disease this boy had. God made sure that he didn't die. God made sure David had enough to invigorate him and this boy can lead him to the place he needs to be. So God takes microbes, germs, bacteria, and he makes them perform his sovereign will. Well, notice the cruelty of the enemy in verse 13. They, I fell sick three days ago and they left him for dead. He is used up. He is unneeded. He is uncared for. He has been left to die, even though in verse 16, the enemy is eating and drinking and dancing. The Bible says the mercies of the wicked are cruel, but the righteous hath compassion even for his beast. 
Men that are alien to God are alien to suffering and alien to the cares of their fellow men. Matthew Henry said, it is the wicked that will abuse those in their employ. The pay of the laborers that has mowed your fields and has been withheld by you cries out against you. And the cries of those who did the harvesting that you did not pay has reached the ears of the Lord of harvest. It's in James 5. This is a text in the north in the 1800s, mid-1800s, that um, reformers used on northern factory workers that would hire immigrants and use them for nothing and get rid of them when they found immigrants that would work for less and put them into essentially white technological slavery and uh, simply because of the laissez-faire attitude of American business and nobody would step in. And this is what the reformers would preach. You are no better than the Amalekites that use them until they're sick and cast them out to die because you got new guys and new meat that came in as slaves. And that is not right. Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master who is in heaven. Amen. Pay the guys that work for you. Don't mistreat those that are under you. Well, that's what they did. And thus, the abused is going to be an instrument of divine wrath. The weak will be an instrument of divine strength. The foolish is going to be an instrument of divine wisdom. Evil always comes back to haunt the perpetrators. And so they're going to wonder, how did David find this? Because of that Egyptian kid that we tossed out to die. Well, in 11b, look at the contrast in this king. It says, they brought him to David and gave him bread and he ate and provided him water to drink. David, in contrast, bestows his grace. Why? Because David is a Jew. And a Jew had a divine standard for right and wrong and man and his moral obligation and the dignity of his fellow man. Even though you're a slave, an Egyptian, left for dead, you have dignity. Amen? That's the advantage of being a child of God is you're a philosopher. So David looks at him in a whole different way worldview. Incidentally, these are texts that you use in teaching Christian and its view of philosophy. Here's a polytheistic pagan Amalekite. He looks at a man and says, let him die. He has no ultimate meaning. David says, shut down everything and take care of him. He has final meaning. It's what you believe about God that determines how you treat your fellow man. It's a good message in the Congress right now. As soon as I get invited. Well, in verse 12, they gave him a piece of fig cake, two clusters of raisins, and he ate and his spirit revived. He had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and for three nights. Now, does this act of David look familiar to you? Hang on just a second. Here is David who is wanting. He doesn't have a lot of food. They've just eaten six days worth of food and they found nothing back at the house. He's wanting. He is not, this is not convenient. He's on a journey to save his wives and the wives and children of these men. It's inconvenient. The, he does not know that this man is an informer that can lead him. He is of no use. He is a non-Jew. He's not just a non-Jew. He is a former enemy of Israel. He's not just that, but he was serving the Amalekites that took his wife or his, his two wives. He doesn't have food to give, but he's sacrificial. He gives to one who is as good as dead. This remind you of anybody? Of a Jew that fell among robbers and was left for dead and his enemy found him, a Samaritan. And he took of his clothing and he made bandages, took of his wine, took of his oil, put him on his beast, took time from his journey, took him to an inn, took care of him, paid for his past, and he said, I'm coming back. 
and I'm going to pay for his present and his future. I'll take care of him. What's that story? It's about a Samaritan, and he's good. What do we call that story? Good Samaritan. This is the good Samaritan. And incidentally, who's the ultimate Samaritan that found you and I, his enemies, as good as dead, and stopped and came to us and took his clothing and clothed us, his blood, his oil, his spirit, and placed it upon us and carried us in the dark of our unconsciousness and put us in an inn, not a final destination, but a stop off. And he took care of us and paid for what we did, paid for what we were doing, and paid for what we will do. And that Jew woke up and he said, how did I get here? Well, your enemy stopped. And he took care of everything you needed. And he put you in a place of safety. I'd love to thank him. I've never seen him. He's gone away. But he's coming back. Amen. And he's going to finish the deal of all that you have owed. Who is the ultimate good Samaritan? Jesus, yes. And so David is an Old Testament man with a New Testament heart. He's not just under law. He is under grace. Well, uh, and his good deed is going to return because he doesn't know it. All he did was a good deed. But lo and behold, uh, this man is going to serve as an informant and is going to be the means by which David will find them and will gain back his people. Faithful guys get lucky. They really do. They, they fall into blessing. God didn't say, he said, go out and I'll take care of you. He didn't say you're going to find a guy along the way that's going to have knowledge, take care of him, he'll wake up, show you how to get there, and then you'll bring everybody back. God doesn't do that. He just says, I'm with you. I'm with you. Now you head off. Where? Just head off. How am I going to know? Trust me. How am I going to find the way? Trust me. And he did, and God let him. You know what I'd say? I would say, trust in the Lord with all your hearts and lean not on your understanding. and all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Ought to be a verse. <laughs> all right. In verse 13 and verse 14, look at the information. To whom do you belong? I'm a young man of Egypt, servant of an Amalekite. My master left me behind. I fell sick three days ago. God timed his sickness in verse 14. Incidentally, let me give you a sermon within a sermon within a sermon. Can God use sickness to bring about his deliverance? There's a book in the New Testament that the author says, uh, he says, you know that I was among you because of illness that I preached the gospel. And that which was a trial to you in my... My condition, you didn't despise me or loathe me. You received me as an angel of God, as Christ himself. The reason that this guy stopped and preached is because he couldn't go any further because he was sick and it led to their conversion. Who's the guy? Paul, what's the book? And Kendall will take you to lunch. What's the book? What's the book, Don? Anybody? Galatians, Kendall. Right here, all right. See, Kendall, where do you like? You like, want a steak? You got a steak, all right. Uh, what was I talking about? Sickness, Kendall, <laughs> a restaurant. Let's see, here we go. Look at verse 14. Here's information. We made a raid on the Negev of the Carathites, which belongs to Judah, the Negev of Caleb. We burned Ziklag. And David right here must have thought, aha, Ziklag. Verse 15, will you bring me down to this band? What's David asking him to do? Will you flip? Will you turn state's evidence? Will you cease being the servant of the Amalekites that have robbed, killed, and disintegrated you? And will you become the servant of a new king? There have been a lot of gospel messages preached on this. 
I'm asking you to flip on your sovereign. You have a former master who has beaten you to death and left you for dead. He's gotten all he can get out of you. I am willing to stop and give my life for you. Will you follow me? That's what happens to us when we get saved. We change masters. And so, he says in verse 15, Swear to me by God you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring you down. Because he knows that judgment's about to come on these Amalekites. God's hand is on this man. This man has loved me and my former master left me for dead. And so I have to know, you that began this good work, will you finish it? Will you turn on me? You look faithful now when you're stopping and giving of your life. But is this the way you're going to be through the whole of my life? Will you take care of me when judgment falls? Yes, I will. Same way with us. You flip and I will take care of you. You bow the knee and you claim that I am Lord and you shall be saved. Will I be saved until the end? Yes, you will. Can I have your word on that? He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that believeth on me shall never die. I'll give you the earnest of my spirit on the dotted line. All the Father has given to me will come to me. The one who comes, I'll not cast out. I will raise him on the last day. Whom I foreknew, I predestined. And those that I predestined, I called. And whom I called, I justified. And whom I justified, I, what's the word? Glorified. I will not drop the ball on you. I'll save you. Incidentally, did this happen someplace else in the Old Testament? There's a woman in a city called Jericho and it's about to come under judgment, she flips. And she says, I've heard about you, the Egyptians, Sihon and Og, you are a people to be feared and a God who is to be feared, and we're in trouble. And so I will protect you, and I have to know that when this wall falls down, because she's living on the wall in Jericho, that you will graft me into the people of God. Do I have your word? And they said, our life for yours if we're not faithful to our word. But we've got to know something from you. Are you going to be faithful till the end? Are we going to have a militia greet us when we come up here? Hang this scarlet thread out your window. Just as Israel was saved by the rushing down of the blood on Passover, you were connected to you by the blood. And so you let us know that you're faithful till the end. She immediately put it out. They came she was protected. Who's the woman? Rahab the harlot. Same way. Gentiles need an oath from Israel's God that I will be cared for until that day. And he does. We did Lila's funeral yesterday, didn't we, Don? And we talked, or two days ago, and we talked about where Lila was. She was in glory. We had no doubt, did we? No doubts whatsoever. You know why? Because God is true to his word. Amen? Boy. Well, in verse 15, he, she, he says, I will bring you down. And he jumps ship. And that's what happens when you become a Christian. You leave your former master. The thief came to rob, kill, and destroy. I am come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Well, he knows that in verse 16, the judgment of God is coming. Just like Augustus McRae said before he rode down on Blue Duck. Are you with me? What are we talking about? Lonesome Dove. You've got to learn the classics. <laughs> Shakespeare, Lonesome Dove. Said, there's Blue Duck in his camp. And Augustus said to July Johnson, they don't know that the judgment of the Lord is about to descend on them. They're eating and drinking and having fun. But here in day, when daylight breaks, hell's about to come to breakfast. He didn't say that. Clint Eastwood would say that. That was in another movie. However, <laughs> sometimes my, my profaneness runs in a different places. 
In verse 18. No, not 18. Verse 16. And when they brought him down, behold, and I'm going to show you folks the way the pagan looks. They were spread all over the land, eating and drinking and dancing. There have been 500 Baptist sermons preached on that message, that text right there. (laughs) On the evil of drink and dancing. You people, many of you don't need to dance. Not for the sake of morality, but for the sake of the arts. (laughs) You don't need to dance. And verse 16, because of the great spoil they had taken from the land of the Philistines and the land of Judah. You know, this is the enemy. They are careless. They are having, see if this doesn't look like what we were, a bunch of pagans. They are having an illicit enjoyment of what is not theirs, what belonged to God, and they have abused it. They are thinking themselves wise and powerful and smart. They think that God's king, David, and God's people are weak and foolish. They think that the promise of God to David to rule is a myth, that the authority of Samuel in the Old Testament was a myth, no truth to it. They are thanking their gods for what appears to be their success because their gods have granted to them debauchery. And they are feeling safe from judgment. These are the wicked and always at ease. Judgment will not come. This is God's strategy. Whenever God brings judgment on people, he doesn't do it with tit for tat, you know, where you cuss and, you're, and a meteorite hits you. To where somebody flips you off and their car explodes. Wouldn't that be great? It doesn't work that way. Number one, you wouldn't have no humans. They would just all have instant death. But God is patient. And so at the Red Sea, the Egyptians run in confident. Then all of a sudden, the walls come down. Jericho mocks Israel till the walls all of a sudden comes down. In Noah's day, they are marrying and giving in marriage, buying and selling, till all of a sudden the flood, boom, it hits. Sodom and Gomorrah in debauchery, all of a sudden, the sky rains fire. Nabal is celebrating, not realizing that David is coming to catch them hungover and to, to remove every man among them. And he would have if there hadn't have been a bride to be won out. Adonijah, we're going to see in 2 Kings, rebels against the will of God through David. For Solomon tries to do a coup. He's living in happiness until all of a sudden Solomon shows up on David's mule and says, you're all dead men. Belshazzar drinks from the articles of the temple in the worship of his gods of wood and stone. And all of a sudden, there's handwriting on the wall. You've been weighed in the balance. You've come up wanting. You're a dead man. That night, the kingdom falls uh, to the Medes. The Assyrians mock Israel. Rabshakeh comes out, says, you're going to eat your dung and drink your urine, my friend. They went to sleep that night, woke up with 185,000 dead soldiers. Herod boasted, and the people said, uh, the voice of a God, not of a man, he took the credit for himself, was eaten by worms. Today, men say, and I quote, where's the sign of his coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it did from the beginning of creation. When they say this, it escapes their notice. By the word of God, the heavens existed, by which the word of God they were formed, And by the word of God, they are kept for the day of judgment. It will come like a thief. The tribulation period, while men are saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them quickly. As birth pangs on one with a child, Armageddon, they're gathered around Israel, and all of a sudden they look on him whom they have pierced. Where is the ultimate case of weakness being used for victory? The cross. Where God dies at the hands of his enemies, and it's the means of ultimate victory. Amen. So don't get too cocky if you're out there scoffing because the only reason you're there is because of God's mercy and you are storing up wrath for yourself because it will come. You know, back when I was at North Texas, one of the greatest athletes of the 20th century. (laughs) Ever so often we'd be playing some team that would have some very aggressive talk and smack 
angry, overt defensive tackle. He'd be right there, always talking, always talking trash. And you'd let him go, and you're waiting for the day. And then it comes. It's like third and three. You need that, and you know he's going to be coming. You call what's called a trap. Any of you guys play some high school football? Remember what a trap is? You make the guy blocking on him, block down. And he seals this nose tackle right over the center. Guy next to him cuts the guy in front of him. You leave that guy loose. You let him go. You turn, give the ball to the fullback. And he's coming. Now, defensive linemen are dysfunctional. <laughs> they hate their mothers. Uh, they got warrants on them, uh, outstanding warrants. They go through five, six marriages. It's just the way they are. And this guy, he's coming. And he's thinking, I'm about to just inviscerate this guy. But what he doesn't know is it's called a trap. This guard right here pulls. This tackle cuts his man. And so the guard comes right here. And he blindsides this guy. <laughs> All right. This guy's coming. And he doesn't know that this offensive lineman is coming on his blind side. He's trapped. And right as he is about to glory, this guy shows up. Offensive linemen are like in uh, criminal justice, uh, home and family living. They, their lockers are neat. They roll up their socks and their shoes. They're Republicans. <laughs> He's coming. And this guy steps across the line and he shows up. And this tackle, he doesn't even see him. He just hears him. And he cuts his eyes. And he puts his helmet right in his ear hole. This guy's IQ drops like 12 points immediately <laughs> right there. Boom! And in the, in the film, it's marvelous because he just, the guy just disappears. It's like he's raptured. You hand him up, boom, he's gone. And he's over there on the sideline with all the cheerleaders, and the guy just slides on over there. I love it. That's how God takes guys out. I will let you glory until you're gone. And I will use your aggressiveness to bring you down. It's like the rebellious high school boy that's tired of authority. So he goes off and joins the Marines. <laughs> okay. Verse 17, there's no battle to it. David slaughtered them. From twilight. So he comes like a thief in the night. They're hung over. They're in debauchery. And all of a sudden, judgment falls on these guys. And it says, not a man escaped. Revelry is silence. It's swept clean. God traps them. They disappear. Only 400 that run for their lives. They are not just beaten. They are humiliated. The Bible says the triumph of the wicked is short. In verse 18 and 19, they retrieved everything. David recovered all the Amalekites had taken, rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing. Were the small great son's daughters spoiled? Anything that had been taken. David brought it all back. How did he retrieve everything? Because the Amalekites protected it. Why did the Amalekites protect it? Because they're so arrogant. And they say, this is ours now. And lo and behold, God used their pride to give it to the rightful owners. As Charles read, the wrath of man shall praise you. Thank you, God, for these wicked men that they did not use one thing because of their arrogance. They just took the old Egyptian and threw him out like a retread. And he came back and we now took what belonged to them. Incidentally, where else do you see a man go out, fight a battle, and brings back everything of the enemy and even his nephew 
that had been taken captive and all of his family. It's Abraham, Genesis 14, brings back Lot and brings back all of the pillage that had been taken from Sodom and Gomorrah. That's interesting. Abraham does it, David does it, and Christ leads captivity captive. All the Father has given to me will come to me, and I lose not one. Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, written to the Jewish nation, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. And that is who Messiah is. And so like these two men, he brings back all that God has given to him. Amen. Unscrew light bulb. Okay. Verse 20. But there is unexpected glory. David captured all the sheep cattle which the people drove ahead of other livestock. And they said, this is David's spoil. Earlier, they were about to mutiny. Now they are giving glory to God. God always does exceeding beyond and abundant beyond what you ever asked or thought. They not only got back their own, they got back all of those of the Amalekites. Will Israel get out of Egypt? Yes. And not only will they do that, they will take the pillage of Egypt with them because the Egyptians will willfully give it because they're terrified. Who was the first one of Egypt to willfully give to the Jews riches? The mother of Moses, uh, Hatshepsut, the Egyptian daughter that pays Moses' mother to do what? Be Moses' mother. That's called getting slapped naked and they hide your clothes right there. That's an embarrassment. And so God always does exceeding abundant beyond. Has God forgiven all of our sin? Say yes. Yes. Are we all going to get in glory? Say yes. But has God done what we never expected? He has taken all of the riches and the glory of Christ and given it to us, and we will actually reign with him eternally. We didn't know that was part of the deal. He goes above and beyond. All that Jew wanted was somebody just to give him something to drink, and yet the Samaritan took him to a place of safety. Well, they said, this is David's. They glorified David's wisdom, David's strength, and David's power. We conclude in verse 21 and in verse 22. After the recompensing of the enemies, now we will have the reward of God's people. Just as Christ will judge the world and then reward his people. Now David will. He's going to act as a king. David knows he's about to accede to the throne. And so now the virtues of a Henry V come out of him. Watch this. In 21 and 22... David came to the 200 men who were too exhausted to follow David, who'd been left at the brook Besor. And they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And David approached the people and greeted them. Even though you guys didn't go to battle because you were so weak and despondent and weary, that's okay. Your job was to take care of the baggage. Before we went to battle, we all unloaded this stuff. You took care of it. Good job. Good job. Uh, good lesson right here. The, the first or the last? And the last, I'm sorry, the first or the last and the last are the first. The reason you do that is you don't want anybody thinking they're competing with other people. You're not competing with other people for greatness. You are competing with you. How did you do. Thief on the cross, your believing life lasted for three hours. That was all. Your job was to die trusting when they broke your kneecap and to trust me. Did you do it? I did. Well done. Good faithful servant. Mary Magdalene, what did you do? I came to the tomb to anoint your dead body and I didn't know that you weren't dead. Good job. Good job. Well done. And then we get down the line. Billy Graham, what did you do? Well, I was the chief voice of Christianity through most of the Western Hemisphere. Good job. 
You did your job well. How about you, Martin Luther? I led the reformation of Christianity out of the darkness in the Middle Ages. That's what I ask you to do. Good job. How'd you do, Leonard? Who's Leonard? Nobody knows. What'd you do? I passed out books in Sunday school. I sang off-key in the choir. I heard you. And you sang well. Good job. I didn't make you Pavarotti. You sang like you are. Good job. So the last are first. Does that encourage you? You don't have to be Billy Graham. You got to be you. But you got to be you well. And so he greeted them. And now in 22, the wicked and the worthless men among them who went with David. Do you mean that among the faithful you can have wicked, worthless people? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. The visible church a lot of times has wicked men in it. It's the invisible church. Those that God knows are his elect. The Lord knows who are his. Even among David's men, there are what are called in 22, that word worthless in the Hebrew means sons of Belial. Kendall, it's a quarter after. I'm not done. I need to continue. I can continue in the word of God or at your behest, I can quit. May I continue? Would that be okay with you? Yeah. There's no use going back to see the cowboys. <laughs> They're not playing today. They didn't play on Thursday. <laughs> Life has no meaning. Verse 22, the wicked now come out because they didn't go with us. We will not give them any of the spoil we've recovered except to every man, his wife, children, that we may lead them away and depart. All that we did, they don't give. These guys are proud. We did it. They are punitive. We're just going to send them out without any, anything. They're just on their own out here in the desert. Nice guys. Uh, they're condescending. They won't up to our level. They watched the baggage. We fought the battle. They didn't do what we did. They're no good. Mind you, somebody. Lord, tell Mary to get up and help me do all this. She's left me to do all the serving alone. I'm the only one here serving you. Martha, Martha, shut up. It's a living Bible right there. Just, just shut up. Uh, these guys are hurtful. They're cruel. They're condescending. And they're greedy. They want more for them. Now, just a couple of days, hadn't they just lost everything? And now they've got some stuff and it goes right to their head. Can money make you stupid? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're simply called sons of Belial, and they're very deceitful. They do it all under the guise of spirituality. They didn't serve with us. Send them on their way. You remember a fellow at the Last Supper? A woman pours perfume on the body of Christ, readying him for burial, and the guy says, why was all this wasted? We could have sold it for 300 denarii and fed the poor. And everybody went, ooh, impressive. Who was that guy? Judas. Did he want to feed the poor? He wanted more money to embezzle. So even at the first, there are bad guys among the faithful. And they're just called sons of the devil. I would like to think if the rapture took place right now, there'd be nobody to turn out the lights. But the fact is there would be. So God knows who they are. Well, in verse 23, this king says, No, you must not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. He says, We are brothers. We are family. We are a body. And all that we have, God has given us. He kept us and delivered into our hand the band that came against us. None of us can be haughty for what he did because God did it. Amen. You can't be haughty if you're the best of teachers. 
What do you have that you didn't receive? And you can't be kind and descended upon if all you do is a lowly act, so to speak, because God gave you that ability. So the eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you. The foot can't say, because I'm not an eye, uh, I am needless. No, sir, you bloom where you are planted. And so this wise king has recompensed the enemies, and now he's about to reward the faithful. And he says, no, you, no sir, you little guys, good job. You famous guys, you need to get your heart right because you did the right thing and you did it for the wrong reason. And this produced success has ruined you. A man is tested by the praise accorded him. Well, in verse 24, who will listen to you? We're not going to have this. This will not exist in our nation. Not going to be. It can be in all the nations around us. But we are Jews. We have what we have because of God. So we will bind here what is bound in heaven, that kind of arrogance. We will loose here what is loosed in heaven, that kind of humility. We will be a reflection of God on the earth. Does this sound like a pretty good king? This is Henry V emerging right here. There's no longer is this a armor bearer. No longer is this a, a meals on wheels guy. This is a king. And in verse 24, as his share who stays by the baggage, so his who goes down to the battle all shall share alike. When you are judged, it will be for what you did. Come into my kingdom. Well done. I gave you more to work with. Were you faithful with what I gave you to work with? Yeah. In verse 25, interesting. It has been from that day forward. He made it a law. This is the first legislation of David. And you know what the legislation is? Get ready. A new commandment I give to you, he says. And here's the new commandment, that you love one another. As I have loved you, as God has loved you, you love one another. Y'all remember somebody else that said that? At the Last Supper, a new commandment. Because the whole of the law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor. David is a New Testament man in an Old Testament dispensation. In verse 26, and now he goes to his friends. We've got the little guy, we've got the upfront guys, we got the bad guys, and now we come to the supporters, the faithful guys. He came to Ziklag and he sent some of the spoil to the elders of Judah, his friends. There are the guys in verse 31. We're, all, we're, we're at the places David was accustomed to go. During this last, these years that I have run for cover, you were guys that I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was naked and you clothed me. And when I did it, you just got the scorn of Saul. You put your lives in danger like the priest of Nob and you thought nobody cared. Well, it's payday. With bad guys who are careless, judgment comes. With arrogant men who are arrogant, correction comes. But with little guys, I know who you are because what you did to the least of these, you did to me. You honored God. And so it's payday. And you'll notice here, uh, he begins in 27 at Bethel. That's where the tabernacle was. After Shiloh, they placed it in Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. And so he goes to the religious leaders and he says, I'm not changing anything. I support the word of God. And then he goes to places that we never heard of. Ramoth, Jatir, Aruar, Sifmoth, Eshtemoa, Rekal. Little insignificant places, but he remembered them. Nobody else cared, but he said, I know who you are. And in verse 29, to the cities of the Jeremiahites, you know who the Jeremiahites are? If, I, if my notes are correct, they were Canaanites. But you flipped, and to all these Jews who were there, you supported them. And so to you converts, thank you. And to the cities of the Kenites, you know who the Kenites were? They were the descendants of Moses. And they are ancient converts to Judaism. And so what Moses held out as being true, 
I'm going to acknowledge you. What the tabernacle acknowledges, I will acknowledge. And at the very end in verse 31, he came to Hebron. Hebron is the city of Caleb. It's the Boston of Israel. It's the first, it's the Plymouth Rock of Israel. Whenever the spies went in, they went to uh, the area of Hebron. Uh, Caleb said, I want Hebron. And so he went to Boston. And so David sent gifts and he let the Jews know, if you're a faithful priest and Levite, you got a friend. If you were faithful to the king, I'm your friend now. If you are a Jewish dignitary from the days of the conquest, I'm going to continue that. If you're a follower of Moses, I'm going to continue that. And if you're an outright pagan that has looked to God, I'm going to continue that. I'm with you. I'm not changing anything. I will continue to be the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, just like our Lord. But you notice who isn't mentioned? Keilah and Ziph that turned on David. And now he is silent. And it is a deafening silence. Pray with me. Thank you, Father, for this day. And thank you for the beauty of thy word. And we see this great king arise. No longer just this 16-year-old protecting lambs, no longer just a court musician, no longer just a general, no longer the man running for his life, having to leave Michael, having to leave Jonathan, having to leave his family, having to leave Israel. We now see payday. We see him at the head of his troops. And here in just a little bit in Hebron for seven years, Israel will come to him like a great army. And then he will bring this nation into Camelot. Might God these abiding truths last with us. And as we must obey you in a world that doesn't care. In a world that doesn't applaud us. In a world that doesn't cheer us. That's fine with us. Because there's one uh, approval that we long for. One approbation that we delight in. And that is you. Well done. Good faithful servant. Our day shall come and we'll remember this in Christ's name.